from our front porch as I sit here. It's a place where we get to watch the trees become green with life as the spring months continue to roll through. We get to watch people out walking and riding their bikes and enjoying life. It's a place of peace. It's even one of seclusion. We can sit here and kind of forget about the rest of the world. Maybe even think that they know this peace that we feel sitting out here as well. But that's not the case. Today, as we celebrate Pentecost, the birthday of the church, I'm reminded that the world is constantly changing. Not only has the church changed in the last couple millennia, but even has drastically changed in the last few months. We'll see a small example of that in the construction that is continuing to occur on our building. But it's not just that. The way in which the church has responded to its call in the world certainly has changed. And yet the mission has stayed the same. We are to seek justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. We are to love God and our neighbor. That call that has been around for more than than 2,000 years remains with us now. And as a people, a church that is constantly evolving, we need to seek out new ways of doing so as well. Where there is injustice, we do seek out justice, and we speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Where there is war, our call is to find peace and not further violence. Our call is to be God's loving hands and feet in the world, no matter where we are. Because the church does not live on some secluded porch. It lives in the world and should react to what is happening in the world as well. This is an important thing to remember as we celebrate the birthday of the church and its continued mission. And so today... I hope that this worship continues to strengthen you and refresh you as you go about living out that gospel with whomever you interact with. Happy Pentecost. Now stop. 
of John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came. He stood among them and he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And, and then the disciples, they rejoiced when they saw that it truly was the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. In anticipation of Pentecost, that festival day of the church year we celebrate in this worship at home, the day of the church year that honors and marks the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives and the life of the church. In anticipation of this celebration, I have prayed, I have prayed for the Holy Spirit to come unlike any Pentecost before. I've prayed fervently, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Remind us why you love us. Remind us why we must love one another. Remind us how to love one another. I have prayed, give us strength. Give us strength to confront the difficult realities of this life with prophetic voices grounded in love. For the prophetic word we receive today, like every Pentecost Sunday, comes in part from the second chapter of the book of Acts. This scripture describes the days after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus the Christ. We hear about people gathered in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost and, and that it was chaotic. The people spoke in their own language and no one understood anyone until God's Holy Spirit touched upon them like a fire. The cities go up in flames. This is a tough metaphor for us today. But then, then we hear another instance of God's Holy Spirit touching humanity in our gospel text today. And in our gospel text, as the resurrected Christ Jesus appears to the disciples in the room where they had holed themselves up immediately after his violent death, uttering words of peace, he goes on to show them his hands and side, scars that remained despite his resurrected status, scars that remind what he went through for all of us. And then, reminiscent of the Old Testament, as God's Holy Spirit is so often imaged as the very breath of God, Jesus breathes on the disciples, giving them his very life, his Holy Spirit. But, but breath, breath, as, as people struggle to breathe, this is another tough metaphor for God's Holy Spirit for us to hear today. I mean, I hear these metaphors for God's Holy Spirit, fire and breath, I fall to my knees with an aching in my heart, wondering why all I can think of when I hear of fire and breath today, Pentecost Sunday, isn't God's Holy Spirit, but rather death and destruction and violence and nothing getting better in the world in which we live. And I, I watched a video from a colleague who I don't personally know, but one who pastors a church in Southeast Minneapolis. She's eight months pregnant, and, and she walked around her neighborhood, a neighborhood that is now marked with the remains of fire as she cried. She was devastated, but she was even more devastated by the cause of the destruction. 
She said, the violence and destruction are but symptoms of generations of inequality. And then with tears running down her eyes or down, down her cheeks, she said, I, I just, I don't know what to say. She was grateful for people coming and helping. And then she asked that maybe we would just simply check back later. Jesus, the resurrected Christ, says in today's text, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. In other words, if you forgive sins, you free people. You see them that way. And then he continues, if you retain the sins of people, they're retained. In other words, people remain unforgiven by his followers. I mean, after having come in peace, Jesus reminds the disciples locked away in fear that he came to them and chose them to walk within life, to teach and encourage and challenge and, and love. And now he needs them to go out into the world and make their own judgment calls of forgiveness or not. But after having traveled with him, after having seen so much, after having experienced grace upon grace with him, Jesus knows what they'll do. He, he trusts they will know how to be his people. He trusts they'll know what to do. It makes me wonder, on this Pentecost in the year 2020, I wonder if Jesus trusts us too. I wonder if, if we can see fire and breath as God's tools of grace and love and, and life, sparking in us a flame for radical compassion the air that we see as, as precious and, and giving for all living things, not something used to, to hurt others. My Holy Cross family knows that on Pentecost Sunday, I often don my pair of cleats as symbolic of God's Holy Spirit described by Jesus early in the gospel, earlier in the Gospel of John as an advocate, one who fights for and, and upholds them. The Greek word for advocate is, of course, paraclete, or as I prefer to pronounce, pair of cleats. I know, it's cheesy. <laughs> and in an effort to find new and creative ways to talk about God's Holy Spirit, I've, I've not worn my cleats the last few years on Pentecost, but as I prayed, as I prayed this year, come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus, this year I was convicted to dust off my cleats because God's Holy Spirit maybe is better imaged for us today as a pair of cleats that helps us dig in, run the race set before us, supported and stronger than without it. We don't have to be perfect in this discipleship race. Remember who Jesus commissioned in today's text, but we do need to lace up our cleats and, and, and move. I mean, Jesus doesn't call his disciples to some kind of superhero level of discipleship, but he does call us to go out, sometimes needing to dig in, finding our value and peace as God's beloved and seeing that in others. And, and we go out into the world touched by the risen Christ, forgiven and forgiving as Jesus does, never alone as we pray, come Holy Spirit. As construction began on our narthex, the 1974 cornerstone had to be removed here at Holy Cross and we found a time capsule behind it. In the capsule, we found pictures of all the Sunday school classes and it reminded me once again that loving children has always been part of the ethos of Holy Cross. In one picture, our own youth director, Ben Gray's mom, was pictured with her Sunday school class and in another, it was his grandmother. I mean, what an example of those touched by the Holy Spirit and then engaging others with that same love. Stick around in this worship at home as, as we continue for, you, for you'll see an, an update on the construction here at Holy Cross, as well as more of the contents of the time capsule, including a cassette tape that included the Holy Cross congregation from 1974 singing the Church's One Foundation. The Church's One Foundation. I think that might be a better metaphor for us today. Join me in praying that God's Holy Spirit, God's paraclete, pair of cleats would encourage us as followers of Christ who loves us so much, would encourage us to go out and love others as we journey upon this strongest foundation, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.